we all have situations where we've got something dying in the landscape and uh, we've kind of puzzled as to what might be causing it. And this technique that we're going to talk about here, it's probably no, nothing new to most of you, um, is basically how we're going to figure this thing out. Most plants, uh, as we have either root disease from overwatering, root loss from various different sources, uh, be it gophers or construction, um, or simply lack of water, show drought symptoms when they're under stress. Um, so what the way we figure this out is we start looking at if the whole plant begins declining fairly all together overall we're seeing similar symptoms from branch to branch that sort of thing or the symptoms are restricted to the south or southwest side uh, that's a good sign that we've got a water problem but water problems as are pro related to root problems and so we're going to talk about how to try and disentangle some of this stuff okay so you know, uh, half the time when I get these kinds of questions, people bring stuff in. And this is an actual sample that somebody brought in, you know, and it's like, okay, I have this dying twig, what's wrong with my plant? Um, and it's a little challenging to diagnose from that, but um, th there, are, as I mentioned, there are a host of different things that we could be looking at. Everything from overwatering and root disease, drowning in clay soil, you, the plant, Certain plants especially do not have to actually have a root disease like a Phytophthora or a malaria uh, to have their roots simply stop functioning when they're in too much water. Um, roots for most plants require oxygen and if they sit in water for months at a time in compacted clay soils, they will drown. Um, and then, you know, and that kills them. Um, so, and that's pretty much the same as if a gopher clipped it off or somebody comes in with a backhoe or um, parks a car on it all the time. So here are some examples. Uh, this is box. Uh, I believe this was Corda Madeira. And um, you know, you're looking at this and you're kind of going, huh, at least one of these plants doesn't look good. Actually, maybe the middle and the left don't look good. The only one that looks okay is on the right, you know. So what's going on here? It's a fairly new installation. Um, I, don't, I don't have, do I have a laser? I do. So right over here, I don't know if it's showing up in the slide, you can see they've got a, um, a laser line there. So pretty clearly the plants are should be getting water. The question is, you know, what's going wrong? So I'm going to look at, the, we'll figure these things out as we go. I'm just bringing up examples. Okay, so th then this is also a, a sort of a classic case. We have a fruitless mulberry um, in Terra Linda, and it's not looking good. I, the, we got dead branch tips all the way out here. The whole tree's yellowing, and, and why, it, what's going wrong with this versus you know, here we have an agave that is bubbling and the leaves are dying. You can only barely see it here, but there's a bunch of exudate coming from the base and we're wondering what's going on there. And you know, the te the, what we're going to do to figure these things out is really essentially the same. Um, so we'll take a peek at some of this. Oh, and finally we have uh, a whole garden showing similar uh, symptoms. We've got uh, blackening, the new growth is dying here on roses. I don't even remember what plant species this is. I think it's something like a um, verbena, but you know, the plant's declining uh, fairly much overall. We have a few little spots that are making it. Okay, so we're gonna do root crown inspections. That's the plan. Um, and so we should see the deficiencies distributed over the entire plant. Uh, and this includes water deficiency symptoms in, uh, distributed over the entire plant, even if we think that this is overwatering. Um, what we're really going to be looking for are symptoms near the root crown. So we're going to be looking for when we do the inspection. So we're going to look at the tree overall and we're going to see this and then we're going to home in on the base of the tree and we're going to look for things that look like this. So this is a cherry tree and uh, it's got, these are not normal, this is the bleeding, almost everything in Prunus does this, I know you guys know. Um, and so we'll take a peek there or we're looking for other things like this. This is Arbutus marina strawberry tree or Arbutus unato sometimes can look fairly similar um, and you get this 
and so this is a canker. This was a canker too, by the way. You just, the canker is sort of hidden under there. You'll see it when we peel back the bark. And this, you don't need to peel back the bark. You can pretty much trace the outline of the canker just looking right here. And the vertical cracking is the wood drying out. And um, this eventually will start turning a darker color. You can see the dark beginning here as it creeps up the side of the tree. Um, anybody seen any of this? Yeah, plenty? Good. So if you guys see it and you feel like working with me a little bit on this, um, maybe we can um, cut some samples up and send them to Suzanne Latham at CDFA. And uh, if you have a moment, yeah, is, is, that's a question. Yeah, does Arbutus Marina have the same problem? This is really almost only on Arbutus Marina. So um, yes, and it's, it's rampant in, in the Bay Area right now. And we do not know what it is. We have some ideas. The problem is this. Um, yeah? Uh-huh. Yeah. So I know that I'm like CSF now that all those tracks on them because it takes about less than two years, maybe three years to kill the tree. Right. So um, I saw one I've seen one hang on in Santa Cruz for about five. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule. I agree with you. Everything you've said is accurate. I mean as far as my so we share we're we're simpatico. Yeah, we I know that seeing the same thing. Yeah, and we haven't given you an answer yet. I'm yeah, so sorry. Well, we have some answers, but, you know, Right, exactly. So, um, so Arbutus Marina is getting this. If you guys want to, uh, let me know. I'll see if I can come down and pick it up or something. I cut them up and send them into CDFA. The best success we're having right now is trying to isolate from the root balls. When I say best success, the problem is this. You've got... I'll make an analogy. You got a dead cow in the field, right? You see a vulture on the cow. Oh, well, vultures must be killing the cow, because every dead cow I see, I got a vulture on, right? It's, it's not necessarily true. Well, we have the same problem with this. We try isolating from the root ball of this, and we get something back consistently. Just because we get something back off a dying root ball consistently does not mean it's killing the plant. That means then we have to take that thing and find a healthy Arbutus marina, put it in a pot in a greenhouse, inoculate it, and see if we can get the same symptoms. If it's capable of killing a healthy tree, then we might have the pathogen. But you know, there's a lot of things living on these root balls, and a bunch of them are not killers. They're just decay origins, organisms, agents. Or, OK, um, one of those two words. I conflated them. Um, yeah, question. We have seen it show up two or three feet above the base of the tree because this is really, when you cut these in sections, this is coming up through the middle of the tree. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Eutypa or Neofusicacum, or maybe you know it as dead arm in grapes. Um, so, but this stuff is going up, it's attacking some, we believe it's attacking through the base of the tree, and it looks like it's coming up through the the core of the tree, and then it's working its way out. So that's why you see it dying here. I'll just do this. You see it dying. It's killed this section, and the tree, you can see this faint little bulge where it's trying to grow over the outside of the thing, and it's trying to you know, compartmentalize the decay. You guys are all know Shigo, compartmentalization of decay in trees, um, and grow over it. Unfortunately, what will happen is in the next couple of years, it will bake break that inner barrier on the inside of the tree and punch through to all that new wood and kill that too. So it, and it takes several years for it to, for this to occur, but that's why the decay. Anyway, we're getting off, off topic. We can keep, yeah. Is this possibly another uh, victim of Phytophthora No, I do, I mean, that's a good question. We thought the same thing, but Phytophthora tend to work on the outside of the tree and kill the living tissue. 
and they do not work from the inside. That's why we think it's one of these Botrysferia neofusicacum, one of these deep wood uh, decay agents, sorry, decay agents, pathogens that's, that's working its way out. Um, okay, so this is what we're trying to figure out when we're doing, these are the kinds of things that we're using this technique for. So if we have acute drought, um, what are we going to see? We're going to see something like fresh growth wilting. We're going to see hardened growth being less affected. We're going to see uh, potentially some sunburn on the, um, on the more mature leaves. The soil will be dry. And if we do a root crown inspection here, we should expect to find healthy roots because it's just acute drought, as opposed to chronic drought, um, where the fresh growth will be stunted. Often it's chlorotic, and we can go into the ABCs of why that is plant physiology. But basically, a plant that doesn't have water can't do what? Yeah, provide nourish nourishment, move minerals, all that other stuff. If it has no nourishment, if it has no sugars to build, it can't build, do th things like build accessory pigments that help make the tree not sunburn. So it's basically running um, a deficit every year. Now, that's not going to happen on an annual plant. Annual plants don't run deficits every year because they're dead by the end of the first year, right? So chronic drought's only going to really happen on larger trees and, and those kinds of things. We'll go back to that in a little bit. But again, even in chronic dr drought, root crown inspection should reveal healthy roots in a perfect world. And this is what you're going to find. So this is a sample from underneath that tree. OK? The grass, this, this isn't rocket science. I mean, you guys are going to laugh and say, yeah, you need to run a soil sample on this. But I did it just to sort of say, look, how crumbly and dry the soil is in the top inch or two of the soil. That tree has nothing to work with, right? And then I took another one from a tree nearby that looked comparatively healthier. And it, well, the tree looked bad, but the lawn looked better. So um, you're thinking it's getting water. Well, yeah, it's getting water in the top two inches, and it's still crumbly and dry down below that. So the tree's getting nothing. So you know, um, a soil probe is helpful when you know. Pay attention to the uh, the depth of the uh, the soil. Pay attention to the soil when you're excavating around the root of the tree. Now, winter flooding can produce the same thing. So I mean, what do you think is happening to the roots here? To the trees. Yeah, they're drowning. They're, they're not getting any oxygen. And when, you know, roots need oxygen just like anything else. Now, you'll find exceptions to this, you know, swamp cypress and some things like that. They have arenchyma. They can move air down into their roots so that they can breathe underwater, essentially. But um, what happens here is that the fir first roots to recover, now, this, this rancher. It's, it's not really the best photo, because the, um, this orchardist is flooding their fields. This is flood irrigation. This is fine, right? Because the plant can take this for a couple of days. It's when it sits like this for weeks that we generally have problems. Um, and even when it sits like this for weeks, eventually the water subsides. And which roots recover first? The surface roots, because they're the ones that dry out first. So the ones that typically die when we have winter flooding problems in clay soils, flats with poor drainage, they're going to be the deep roots, which means when summer comes around, the plant's left with surface roots only, and it can't chase the water as it goes down. So that's when you're going to start seeing either chronic or acute drought symptoms. So this is an example. This is a petosporum that was planted in situations that we're just discussing, um, flat clay pan that floods in the winter. This is what we found when we went through and started looking at the base of the tree. And you can see that something, that decay, came up and, and got it. Now, this probably was a Phytophthora, based on what it looks like here. But it's a little bit, you guys remember the disease triangle, right? You got to have the target organism, you got to have the disease, you got to have the environmental conditions that are right. Arguing about whether this was environmental conditions or Phytophthora is a little bit of a chicken or the egg kind of argument because the Phytophthoras survive in the right environmental conditions. So usually I 
now we're getting to this problem of attribution and what do you tell a client, you know, what do we have? Do we have a drainage problem or do we have a Phytophthora problem? And that, right, yes, you do. Um, so, of course, we got construction. So this is going to, obviously, we've lost a few roots here. Um, and this is going to be a problem. That tree will probably look good next year and maybe not so much after that. And that's because the tree itself has, is a massive storage system for energy. So the symptoms of the impact here might not be seen for years. I mean, OK, this is a bit extreme. Um, so you might see symptoms next year. In more subtle cases, it'll last a little longer. Shorter plants, you have a shorter timeline. And so when we do a root crown inspection here, and I'll get to what a root crown inspection is you know, in a little bit. Um, it might show a pathogen, it might show root damage, but it really depends. You're not going to see the root damage. You'll see the root damage here for a, on a root crown inspection. But if they did the trenching three or five feet out and you do a root crown inspection right around the base of the tree, you're not going to see the root damage necessarily. So this is a case where a, a good site history is going to be important. I know you guys know this. You're working your own. A lot of you manage your own landscape, so you're going to have a site history. But if you're a master gardener or if you're in the trades, Half the time you're showing up for the first time and somebody's called you after the plant's halfway down the, down the slide and saying, hey, can we save this? And you need to understand what's been happening in the last five to 10 years before you even got there. So uh, this is a case where we might want to um, really focus on our interview more than that. Compaction, this can be subtle. You know, it's really obvious when you've got a whole bunch of cars parked right underneath the tree. But again, you may not get called out or you may not even know that people are parking cars on this particular site when you get asked to figure out what's going on. And, you know, it seems obvious. Soil is going to be very hard, and the water isn't going to move through con what's effectively concrete very well. Um, and again, this is not going to be a problem for annuals because they're just not going to want to grow in something that's um, this hard. You'll get weeds. And that's about it. Um, but this, this, nobody's calling you out usually to uh, figure out what the problem is with the reed, weeds. They're calling you because they're trying to figure out what the problem is with usually fairly valuable landscape trees. I'm surprised at how many times gophers are a problem in ur urban areas. Um, I live in Petaluma. We have the sandy loams. Gophers do the backstroke through it. But it's sort of the country, so you expect it. But um, not always in you know, downtown areas. And, Sometimes when I do my root crown inspection, I'll begin digging down and I'll try and go, and there'll be nothing but air underneath the, the trees. Why is that? I mean, you're like, okay, well, because gophers dig holes. Um, but gophers like digging holes underneath plants and underneath water lines and underneath other things like that because they are a roof system for them. You know, those root systems hold the soil in place so it doesn't collapse on them. So a, a, a shrub is a perfect place to dig underneath. And, but unfortunately, if you get the intersection of three or four gopher runs underneath that plant, there's, there's a lot of air there. And, the, so, um, and the gophers tend to get more desperate in drought and start looking for things, wet things to chew on, and you can have a lot of uh, root loss. And all of these things will present, the reason I'm going through these, these, these all will present the same way on the outside. Um, grubs, so this is mostly beetle larvae, and we see it on agave, we do see it on a few other thi uh, things, thuya and um, other moist conifers, um, camiciparis, those kinds of things. We have uh, strawberry root weevils, we have black vine root weevils, and um, but I'm going to focus a little bit on what is becoming an increasing, increasing problem, the agave root weevil. Uh, so this has been in Sonoma, and it tends to be where people break, import succulents from New Mexico and places like that. Uh, but you'll begin seeing these lower bra uh, bracts. I'm not sure that's actually a bract. Um, these lower leaves die first. Um, so this is uh, the agave root weevil. Other weevils are going to look somewhat similar. The strawberry root weevil does not have the classic weevil snout, but it's a weevil nonetheless. Uh, and this is what you're going to typically see. You're going to probably have to pull a couple of these plants because they're going to be so bad that your client's not going to mind. And you're going to find some holes and damage like this. And if you're lucky, you'll find the head of one and the tail of another 
uh, growing right out of uh, these tunnels. Um, the, when you do thuya, you're not going to have enough root tissue here. They're going to be feeding on the smaller roots, so when you do your root crown inspection, you're going to start digging around there. You're going to come up with these little tiny white C-shaped grubs, and there will be a profusion of them. And that's just telling you you're losing all the tiny roots at the base of your, your conifer. So those are the kinds of things that would all produce these, these types of symptoms. So here we have a case. This was uh, San, San Rafael someplace. Um, the house was going on the market. They wanted curb appeal, so they started watering the snot out of the landscape in the front. They, obviously, they're on a slope, so the plants at the top of the slope look great, but all of a sudden, the plants at the bottom of the slope started dying, and the question was, what's going on? So when we do a root crown inspection, what are the first things we're going to do? Anybody, does it, who, who does root crown inspections in the field? Any guys? OK, so one of the people who's raised your hand, anybody want to volunteer what the first thing you're going to do in a root crown inspection after looking at the overall plant? Yeah. Remove any weeds or things on the crown. OK, good. And then how are you going to tell what, then, then tell me the next step after that. Well, I look for damage or decay. And then you'll, good. Depends after that. So what my next step is, after I look for damage and decay, that's going to say where I want to end up sampling. And I'm going to start slicing. I'm going to take these very thin slices, you know, disinfect your tools, um, that just go into the bark enough for me to see the color of the healthy bark. And I'm going to start fairly high on the plant. The problem is this. Most plants have fairly similar colored bark, but you can't be guaranteed of that. For instance, Coast Live Oak, the bark tissue on healthy coast live oak can be anything from burgundy to pale sherbet. And that's a pretty wide range. And if you slice in at the root crown and you find burgundy and you're used to looking at pale sherbet, you're going to think, I found something that looks like root disease. But it's just the healthy tissue on the plant. So I usually start fairly high on the plant and take a nick into what I can, would I'm pretty sure is going to be healthy tissue, so I know what I'm trying to compare against as I work my way down. Does that make sense? So you can see evidence of this. We've got this. So on this particular um, juniper, we've got a pink color for healthy tissue here. And I've sliced a couple different places. And this didn't, I, a word, let's go back for just a second. This is obviously dead. That is not the plant we're working with here. This is pretty healthy, but, and that's the color that we would expect the healthy juniper tissue to be. This is a little paler green. Can you see that? Is it showing up in the slide? That's the plant we're working with. This is already dead. It's unlikely to tell us all that much. We might figure it out. This is much more likely. So this is the plant we're going to work with. And then we're starting high, working our way down, and the soil line was right about here on this particular plant. And as I worked my way down, we went from pink to pink to, uh-oh, this is the color to burgundy and white. So we've got a problem. And we're not going to worry too much about what our problem is right now, but that white, you could then, I went further down, cut another two inches, and just stuck my thumb in and peeled the tissue back. And we have this plaque of white material. So this is our malaria. Um, and I'm not asking that you necessarily remember this stuff. Most of this stuff you can look up on UCIPM. Um, but we are, I am going to bring up our malarias, phytophthoras, and one or two other things, because these are the 90% of the root problems you're going to run into are going to involve these if it's disease and it's not something. And even if it's construction damage and those kinds of things, when you damage the roots so badly and they have a hard time closing in time, you're going to end up, you often end up with one of these things in the root systems. Our malaria, there's a number of different ways to diagnose it. Um, it likes summer irrigation. Um, it's a native pathogen, at least I believe it's native. It's been here for a really long time if it's not native. And uh, it likes consistently warm, moist conditions. And so that means that it tends to thrive in hot summer situations where we irrigate. Because California being summer dry, that those warm, moist conditions don't show up all that often. 
Uh, so you're going to see it in um, vineyards and lawns and places like that. Um, and it really likes injured roots, especially if somebody has removed a tree nearby and not pulled the roots out of that tree. Because our malaria, unlike most of the other pathogens here, survives very well by breaking down. It can survive as a saprophyte. It can eat dead wood, essentially. And it can happily munch on dead wood for decades. Um, in the cases of um, some of the orchards, and so really quickly, um, diverge a little bit here. How did you make money in California in 1849, 1850? Yeah, that's how you made money in California in 1850. You sold denim. I mean, everybody usually says, ah, you go look for gold. The guys who, whiskey also, right. The guys who went out and looked for gold, if they found it, usually came in, bought a pair of blue jeans, blew a bunch of money on whiskey, and th sooner or later they didn't have any gold. The way you really made money in California was you sold fruit, you sold denim, you sold whiskey. So the people who made a lot of money in California happened to be orchardists. So, the, you know, and you guys might remember San Jose had a lot of nice orchards in it once upon a time. I mean, you won't remember having seen it. I don't think anybody here is quite that old. Um, you are? I, I, we had walnut trees in our backyard growing up down there, and there were still fields around San Jose. It's all gone now. Right, exactly. We can still remember uh, that some of those old orchards existed, at least until fairly recently. Um, so what did they do when they got here? Those orchards weren't here in 1830. So when you, if you were an orchardist, you went out and you cut down what? Huge oaks that were the landmark. You know, that's why they called Oakland, Oakland, right? Because they had these, you know, oaks that were three, four, five feet around at the base, uh, five feet across at the base. Um, and did you pull those five foot stumps? Too much work. You could try and burn them. Half the time they would be re-sprouting. They did not want to burn. So you left them in place half the time. You planted your orchards around them. And then what happened? Well, you produced good fruit out of that orchard for about 20 years, but our malaria was in there eating those red, dead root stumps. Right? And when the dead root stumps sort of, when it had finished eating all of them, it took a long time because a five foot oak has a big root system. So about 20 years in, in the 1870s, 1880s, the oak, the, the, our malaria ran out of oaks and it had grown big and fat and mean in the meantime. And what did it go for after that? The only thing that was left all the people's orchards. So in the 1880s and 1890s, a bunch of people who had been sending their kids to college and making a good living as uh, running orchards in the San Jose area, went belly up because our malaria ate their orchards because it simply grew out from those dead ro oak root stumps and went out and attacked the orchards and it was pretty much unstoppable. You guys ever hear of the humongous fungus? Yeah? It's an arm malaria infection that's several miles wide, and we talk about it like it's one, but there's one up in northeastern Oregon, there's another in Idaho, I guess there's another one in Michigan, and they didn't even realize this was the same thing until they, until they flew over the area and saw this huge ring of trees three miles wide. That's an arm malaria infection. So it's a pretty serious thing. This thing can, once it gets established, it can overwhelm a host of fences of even fairly healthy trees. So um, I'm just talking about, this is useful for me, anyway, from remembering all this kind of stuff to remember how our malaria works. And if you've got a dead root stump someplace and you've got a tree declining near it, that would be one of your big clues that you should probably be looking for some of these symptoms. Okay, so here we have um, uh, orange tree. It was in a terrace in San Rafael. Uh, and this orange tree, the pers per new person bought the house, saw that the the soil in the terraces was about eight, 10 inches below the edges of the walls that formed the terrace. And they decided that their orange trees there uh, had needed more soil to really be happy. So they brought in about six inches of topsoil and put it all around their orange trees. And then um, could not figure out the next year why the orange trees were performing so poorly. So 
uh, we went out and we did the root crown inspection. So we did just like the gentleman over here was telling us about. We cleared away all the stuff and looked for bad things at the base of the tree, bleeding spots, cankers, things like that. Didn't find anything. But what we did notice is the tree, instead of having a nice root flare where it went into the ground, just went straight down. And then we were like, hey, does this doesn't look right, you know? And we started asking, what's going on? Can you tell me the history? Oh, yeah, I put six inches of topsoil on this. It's like, oh, uh oh. So then we started digging around the base of the tree. And I made a cut high on the tree, and I worked my way down. And then I had to start digging and work my way down farther and farther until I found the root crown of the tree. And just about where I found the root crown of the tree, so the color of this tree's bark when you slice into it is this sort of creamy, almost butter yellow, but maybe buff, you know, somewhere in there. Um, it's not quite as rich in this picture as it normally, as it would have been. Uh, and about four inches down, I ran, the, the color changed from this cream, buff cream color to, um, to that. And then just below that, I could stick my thumb into the bark and just peel it off. And when I peeled it off, I got this, you see, can you see the difference in the color here? This is a cold white, and that's a sort of a warm white. And, and that's our malaria coming up through the base of the tree. So um, that we were able to figure that out. The other thing that I like to use is um, sometimes it doesn't show great symptoms like this. So your sense of smell is useful. If you can find a fairly rich, fresh infestation, it will smell like fresh mushrooms. It'll smell tasty. Yeah, question. Absolutely. Although it's not great eating, right? I mean, you'd think it'd be nice if it's got the name uh, honey mushroom, right? <laughs> um, sometimes you get cl clumps of tan mushrooms. We saw that in this here with white spores um, coming up. But they'll, they'll come about starting about now. After the first rains, you'll start seeing um, these guys come up. But they're not, you can't use them reliably because if you're trying to do this in June, you're, they're, you're not going to find anything. The problem is this. Um, it doesn't always show these big white mycelial mats. So this is um, Trachylospermum jasminoides, um, so uh, star jasmine. And this is an area with some very healthy uh, myoporum tree. No, no, sorry. Starts with an M, but it's not myoporum. Anyway, um, maiden trees, sorry. Um, had some healthy maiden trees growing around it. Uh, and some redwoods farther away, and all of the uh, star jasmine died here, and we could not figure out why. And I actually started, had a hard time too, because when I was stripping these things out, I, I would take the knife and start peeling the bark off of these things. I was getting nothing, really. Uh, this is the closest, that's the best I got right there. And you will see a little streak of white in there. But one of the problems was, um, and this is the best I found. So I spent like two hours looking out there. <laughs> and most of the stuff looked like this. It was just dead and hard and gone. And then I found one root section that had a few patches of white. And I started saying, oh, now I think I know what's going on. And then as soon as I found that, I started looking at the bark that I had been peeling off. And I was looking at the root. And I had not been looking at the bark. And half the, most of the armillaria for this sticks in the bark. It does not stay on the root. So when you peel the bark off and then you look at the root, you're missing what you should be looking at. So if you're trying to do star jasmine with our malaria on it, it's going to be challenging. But it can, you know, it can be done. You're just going to have to spend some time. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, you know, they talk about our malaria re resistant plants. And you know, that's a little bit like deer resistant plants. They're going to go for what they can get. Um, but you know, the maiden trees out here looked, still looked great. Um, maybe they just handle root loss really well. So how do we manage it? Um, I'm not going to spend a, a whole bunch more time on, uh, on management. It can, there are herb, uh, fungicides out there with our malaria on their label, including some that are fairly environmentally friendly, bio, fungicide, that kind of thing. I'm thinking of um, trichoderma might be on that. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Saccharomyces. No, I'm not remembering it right now. Streptomyces lyticus. Um, I don't want to use trade names because I'm going to get in trouble. But uh, I challenged the people who had it on, because I met them at one of these conferences, and I said, you guys 
have our malaria on your label. I know it doesn't work. You must know it doesn't work. Why is it on your label? And they basically said, because we got bought out by another company and we said, and they said, do you have any results that supports it on our malaria? And we said, well, yeah, in the lab only. You know, we know it doesn't work in the field. And they're like, put it on the label. And he's like, all right, you know. So, okay. So there, you can't trust the labels on some of this stuff because even though they know it doesn't work, you know, the reps know it doesn't work. They won't argue with you. But the higher ups have deemed that it will happen. So um, our malaria management is mostly about managing water. Uh, so if, our, our, like we said, our malaria likes things moist and warm in the summer. So we're going to try and let soils dry out pretty thoroughly between waterings. Now that can get really challenging on clay soils, but um, it, it's, it's what has to be done. There are no chemistries that have been shown to be effective despite what's on the labels, except things that are already being banned, things like um, methyl bromide and those kinds of things, uh, which would have killed your trees anyway. So, um, so your options are really removing the trees or air spading. Air spading can work. It will not revive that dead root. I, it doesn't have a dead root in this picture, but if that was a dead root, it will not revive that dead root. But if you can dry things out and air spade it enough, it can help the tree stop in, incipient infections from getting much worse. So it's, it can be worth a try on, on a as a therapeutic treatment on very minorly infected trees. The guys who do this, most of this work have been in pear orchards. And the big advantage here is that it can keep it from moving from this tree to other trees. Because as we've remembered, our malaria moves from one plant to another plant using a mycelial highway. So the mycelia grow through the soil and it transfers the nutrients from the dead stump and then uses those nutrients to overwhelm host defenses elsewhere. So if you can break up that highway and keep it from transferring nutrients, you can keep this from spreading. Yeah. So air spading involves, uh, perhaps you've seen these guys with these big trailer drawn air compressors. So they're, they've got a generator, a big air compressor. It's usually towed behind a truck. And you are taking a giant hose and this, this part is solid and you have to wear goggles and you generally want to, despite this picture right here, um, you usually want to have uh, some big plywood barriers around, and you are blowing the soil out from underneath the tree to a depth of about six, eight inches. Uh, and this technique preserves roots of about, you know, all the way down to about an eighth of an inch in diameter, which is pretty good. I mean, let's not pretend you're not doing damage to this. You are damaging this tree. It's a bit like stripping every leaf off the tree because you're stripping every root hair off of this thing when you're doing this. But it's not as bad as doing nothing and not letting the R malaria come back in. So uh, it's a fairly effective technique. It's not cheap, it's not quiet, but it can stop movement of infections and it may stop trees that are infected if the damage, if the damage isn't too bad. Um, or I guess I should say this, it may allow the tree to stop the infection. You're not doing much other than changing the environment so that it's not favorable to our malaria. If the tree's not if too far gone, it's not going to stop. I saw a hand. Yeah, other, other than the mycelium infection, what about the pull-off? Like, how easy is it to pull off the mycelium infection? Or is that the it, it puts them at risk, but like we said, our malaria is a, a if not native, then long established pathogen in California. So in the winter, there are spores everywhere. They are blowing in the wind. So worrying about the spores, yes, the mushrooms uh, probably are a source of infection. It's probably not helpful to have them really close to your trees. But let's not pretend that removing those mushrooms is going to uh, take trees that were vulnerable and make them less vulnerable. If your tree is vulnerable, our malaria will find them eventually. So um, I would not say that mushroom, I know this wasn't necessarily your question. Those mushrooms are not a great risk. It's a little bit like worrying about Phytophthora in Marin, Phytophthora morum in Marin County. Um, the bottom line is if you have a tree that's susceptible to it, the Phytophthora is going to find it. 
um, because there are so many spores in, under the right conditions sp moving around. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I, I'll go back here and then I'll get you. Well, that's a little bit like um, Chris's trichoderma question. So trichoderma has usually been uh, touted as something that, that can reduce fungal populations. Or I don't think for a lot of these biofungicides, we don't really know how they work, whether they are displacing things or competing with them or actually preying on them. All we know generally is when we get these fungal populations or bacterial populations established, disease incidence goes down. Usually it's about transmission. Most of these things do not cure the tree that you're applying to. So as of now, we have not heard any really solidly good effects by any biofungicide against our malaria, including trichoderma. Does not work reliably enough to make it worth the effort of uh, applying. Yeah, question. But here's, here's one of the problems with any of the biofungicides, um, and I'm gonna, is that they're living things. So if we have a problem, I'm gonna be glib again, forgive me. If we have a problem with antelope in Africa, right, and there's just too many and they're destroying the thing, we can airdrop cheetahs in there and hope that they establish, but cheetahs are really not adapted to being airdropped out of helicopters. And that's a little bit, I'm, I'm being glib like this, because. Trichoderma and a lot of these bacteria that product, they're not adapted to sitting in a sh box on a shelf. You know what I mean? And when you apply them, if conditions aren't fairly right, it's tr gonna be traumatic for them being introduced to a whole new environment. And if conditions aren't really right, they never get established. And if they never get established, they're not gonna give you control. So we have seen certain biofungicides work really well under certain conditions. The problem is, Getting those conditions right every time is, is tricky, and sometimes we don't know why they don't establish. Um, and that means, and, and your application and your time costs money. And your clients aren't gonna, a lot of clients aren't gonna wanna hear, particularly farmers who've got a million dollars in crop in the field, aren't gonna wanna hear, oh well, we tried, you know, we had a 30% su potential success rate, you know, and they're like, ah. If I've got to pay for the time and money to apply, I don't want 30%. I want 90% at least. Um, otherwise, it doesn't make it cost effective. Anyway, we'll keep moving. Yeah. Just to follow up. I, I mean, I know that there are some data on trichoderma is effectiveness for some root diseases. And I think it was mostly prevented, if I remember right. I'm not sure of Right. Are you distinguishing, are you, when you say that it's not effective for um, our malaria, are you talking about just curative or also prevented? We're saying definitely for curative yeah. and also potentially preventive. One of the things that um, our malaria does is it's got these rhizomorphs, so it, will, it can produce essentially root structures. They're not roots, they are fungal hyphae, but they grow like roots. They are armored like roots, have bark on them. They're armored structures that can move through the soil and hunt for other susceptible plants. That's not like Phytophthora. Phytophthora's swim in the soil. They're these delicate little zoospores and they're easy to eat. These armored structures that our malaria produces, it's a little bit like, you know, standing with your pitchforks against the cavalry charge and hoping you're gonna be able to stop it. You know, yeah, you might do a little to slow it, but you're, things are looking dangerous for you. Um, No, you know, that's the surprising thing for our malaria. They don't, you know, the guys who've been successful at controlling spread, they do not remove the soil. They simply air spade it, dry it out, fluff it up, break the our malaria into a million tiny little fragments, and then let the oil, soil dry a bit, and then they shovel it right back on. And what you're doing essentially is taking a tiger and turning it into a thousand little kittens, and it's not so hard to knock it back, you know? Um, success has been done without trucking off a whole bunch of soil. The problem also is, you know, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. If you're m removing this soil, that means you have to bring soil in from someplace else. And one of the big problems is recently, at least in Marin County, has been clopyrrolid contamination from people using <coughs> 
herbicides that control thistles on ranchlands and yada, yada, yada. If you bring in, you take out the armillaria and you bring in clopyrrolene contaminated soil, you're going to have, you've just traded one problem for another. So I, I don't know what to tell you, but I don't think moving soil is really our best option for most of these. Okay, so that's armillaria sort of in a nutshell. Phytophthora is the, one of the other really big things that we're going to run. And Chris, can you keep, yeah. do we know how we're doing on time? Okay, so Phytophthora is one of the other big things you're going to find in, in soils. So I'm, I'm only bringing up a few of these things because um, these are the harder things to diagnose. Gophers are fairly self-evident, construction damage is fairly self-evident, and I don't have a lot of great advice on how to fix construction damage. And generally speaking, you guys probably know gopher control at least as well as I do. Um, you know, it comes down to trapping if you can, and if you can't, you're going to go to some other kind of, you know, um, poison type options. Um, or you're going to use uh, exploding gas, which I doubt anybody's doing in San Francisco. The, uh, exhaust machine, right? The CO2. Yeah. So that's j another poison uh, option. Yeah. I, I, You don't. Okay, there you go. Um, I know one guy was relatively successful using the the map gas and igniting it, and you know, and that worked really well. Uh, but it breaks water lines. Um, so because gophers make their runs under water lines, because it's a roof, right? Yeah, and we don't consider that a reduced risk technique. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, okay, so. I, I want to bring up Phytophthora. It's the other big thing. Again, this is going to be warm, moist soil. So again, we see, tend to see an uptick in this in drought years, perversely, because people irrigate in drought years more than they irrigated otherwise. So we get more Phytophthora and armillaria infections shortly after we've gone through a drought. Um, so. The problem with talking about Phytophthora, unlike our malaria, which is, you know, there are several different species, but we can talk, fairly talk safely about them all about the same because they all behave about the same. Phytophthoras aren't so simple. There are aerial Phytophthoras, and there are soil Phytophthoras, and there are warm season Phytophthoras, and there are cool season Phytophthoras. So um, I don't want to make it too, we're not going to dive too far into this. Suffice it to say that if you've got a soil-borne Phytophthora, it usually works its way up, and this is um, walnut. Uh, so walnut, again, we start, I started higher. You can't see where I cut in high. I thought I was starting higher. I only took one uh, slightly higher sample on one side of this tree. The color the, of the healthy tissue is sort of an orange gold. It's showing up very yellow in this slide. Um, and you will not find any fungal structures in this. No white mycelial mats, because phytophthoras are all microscopic or f functionally microscopic. Um, and most of these are pr primary pathogens. A lot of plants don't have inherent resistance to them. Uh, they all require free water to infect. So that's why irrigation systems, it's not just necessarily moist soil. They have to have uh, water that's free enough to begin to flow. So they tend to thrive in these dry, dr uh, drench and drought irrigation uh, regimes where, and this is something that, you know, we've been promoting a little bit. I mean, I have anyway. I've been saying, okay, what do you do about your, your plants uh, in drought situations? Water them thoroughly and then let the soil dry. The problem is you need to get to know your plants and how much is thoroughly enough and how dry is dry enough. When do you have to? And if you get this wrong, phytophthoras are going to be your enemies. Um, Any suggestions on that? I mean, one thing that we've been looking at, uh, managed uh, irrigation, some of the irrigation at Presidio, and uh, for the forestry projects, we've been kind of working with a uh, water system that replicates rain events. Normally around here we get a big storm that rolls through, maybe a couple inches, everything is soaked for many, many days, a week or so, and then there'll be a month between the next rain. That's uh, the natural, if we replicate irrigation that way, it's a natural cycle. It gets completely soaked and then you really dry out between the storms. That's nature. And that's what we're thinking of doing because we have better plant results that way rather than just watering three times a week. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts about 
Yeah, that, I mean, and I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know, but that's not going to work for Japanese maple. Um, Japanese maple. Because Japanese maple is not adapted to these sort of really dry cycles. Japanese maple likes things fairly consistently moist. So um, now you can do a little bit of drought and drench with Japanese maple, but what Japanese maple is going to think of as drought and drench is it's going to want, you know, an inch or two of irrigation once a week because it'll dry out in California in that amount of time. And I'm just throwing numbers out there because it all depends, as you know, on your soils. If you've got sandy soils, you're going to have to water a Japanese maple multiple times a week to keep it from burning and looking horrible, um, especially if it's got any kind of exposure. But on clay soils, you could get away with once a week because it holds on to water so well. So your, that technique will work brilliantly for most California natives, which is probably mostly what you're working with anyway. So that should work. But again, are we talking willows or are we talking blue oak? Because they're, they're both trees, but blue oak pretty much can survive all summer long without anything. Um, if you can get it to grow in San Francisco, which you probably can't because of powdery mildew, but you know what I'm saying. So you have to pay attention to the plant and the soil. Yeah, you do. And, and that's all I'm trying to, you know. Um, we already covered that there are soil and aerial forms in warm versus cool weather. We have 200 species of Phytophthora. More are being discovered every year. And your species probably matters when you're doing this. So. Just saying it's Phytophthora isn't necessarily enough. If it's Phytophthora cinnamomi or Phytophthora cactorum, it likes warm, moist soils. If you're dealing with cattle, they're both soil born. If you're dealing with Phytophthora lateralis, it likes cool, wet soils. And it, it kind of shuts down in the summer. So that makes a huge difference on how you're trying to manage this if you're changing your irrigation regime to fit this thing. If you're dealing with sudden oak death, it's not even a soil-borne pathogen. So even though it's a Phytophthora, if you've got plants dying from that, you're not even worried about your irrigation regime. It's off the boards because it's an aerial Phytophthora. Is this sort of making sense? Um, OK, but all require water to infect. And so this is an example, just really quickly, of how we do a root crown inspection. These are two things. They're coming up from about three inches above grade. This is on um, Prunus lusitanica, uh, which is Portuguese laurel. Um, and uh, you're getting these globs. Now, globs, as you guys all know, are a re standard defensive response of anything that's in rosaceae, essentially. You know, you, your prunes do it, your apples do it, um, your Portuguese laurels do it, all that stuff. So this just, this doesn't tell you you have a disease necessarily. You might have an insect boring in there. Somebody might have hit it with a stroller really hard, um, crashed a mountain bike into it, and now it's just bleeding in a, as a defensive response. Um, so, but, so we slice in. The health, color of the healthy tissue is this pale green, and then we find this hard, uh, hard line here. That's typical, not always the case. You also notice that where it was bleeding here, it's, it's oozing out here. You'll see this little thing. I, I moved the camera a little bit. It was not my best work, but um, you get the idea. So, and you'll find that the, the, unlike our malaria, where you could stick your thumb in and peel it back because the our malaria digests the wood and digests the bark and makes it soft, Phytophthora just kill, cares about killing things. It doesn't decay. This bark is as hard, if not harder, than this bark. Um, and the Phytophthora, if you're trying to isolate it, is only along this little margin. It's, I mean, there's a tiny bit left back in here, but if you're trying to isolate this for sampling, this area back here is lousy. You'll, you'll have success maybe one time in 20. If you, get, if you try to isolate here, you'll get success more like one time in four. And if you try to isolate here, probably none. Although sometimes you will be able to isolate Phytophthora slightly in advance of the, the mortality line. Obviously, the prognosis for something like this might be a little different than something like this, where half the tree's gone. Um, there's, pro you know, at this point, even if we had things that we could treat with, and tr Phytophthora is at least treatable. Um, there are no visible fungal structures. You need lab testing. And I think I covered most of this. Um, the discoloration often isn't as dark and stark as this. It may just look like somebody put a 
wash, a thin wash of uh, watercolor paints over it. I've, I've got other, hopefully I've included that. But so there's a number of different ways. You can almost see where it's worked its way. This, on this walnut, it's being very slow. It's, it's, it's probably only made an inch of progress this year. Okay, so do you remember those, um, oh, question, Krista, yeah. Yes, you will. So it gets a little challenging, though, because the cool season Phytophthoras will infect and kill in the cold winter months. But because your plants aren't, don't have much water demand, they can get by on very little water in the cold winter months. So you usually don't see symptoms, even if it's a cool season Phytophthora, until the beginning of summer, when those days where the day lengths really start to stretch out in June and early July. And usually that's at the very beginning of the irrigation season. So all I can say is you'll see the symptoms in summer for all of these. It's just that the cool season Phytophthoras will show up a couple of weeks earlier than the warm season Phytophthoras, which usually don't get going until June and July when people start irrigating. And you'll see them show up in late July, August, September, and then it falls off again. Does that make sense? Yeah, we could talk about that one for a long time and not come to any conclusions, I imagine. You know, I imagine if it's there, Phytophthora cinnamomai is famous on avocado. It's a big killer. If you guys have heard of the ash burner system of being able to use mulch to suppress Phytophthoras in soil, I mean, that, that worked really well in Australia. He was an avocado grower who did that research on his own because he got frustrated because nobody had any answers for him on how to stop cinnamomai ripping through avocado orchards. Um, his last name was Ashburner, so that's why it's called the Ashburner system. Um, so it works. It, you can get control. It is about ir irrigation system management. It's also about building up uh, a healthy, vibrant so soil. There are biological treatments that are fairly effective for some kinds of... So when we were talking about Streptomyces lydicus, Bacillus subtilis, or Trichoderma, all of these things have been shown to be fairly effective against Phytophthoras, sometimes amazingly effective against Phytophthoras. But again, the, the success rate tends to be in the 25, 30, 50% rate, not in the 80, 90% rate. This, the good thing is a lot of these things are fairly inexpensive to apply, and they can be applied just using a watering can you know, simply around the base of the, the trees. So um, if you can get them established, it's, it's not hard to do. Are those technically pesticides? Or they, just they are technically pesticides. Um, so you do, and some of them, particularly uh, streptomyces and things like that, do have labels where they can be applied with high pressure equipment. And then you do have to be very careful because just because they're natural doesn't mean they're particularly safe. So people have, uh, Streptomyces lydicus, I believe, is one of the examples. I think it may be true for bacillus as well, um, where if you inhale finely volatilized aerial droplets, it can colonize your lungs. Um, and that's not a good thing. So, um, or you, you at least, some people have more commonly, people develop, uh, because it tries to colonize your lungs and your body builds a defensive response, you become um, sensitized to it and you can develop some pretty serious uh, allergic reactions to it uh, on subsequent applications. So you want to wear a mask, you want to follow your labels, and you know, I mean, I know you guys get harped on all this time about this stuff, but 
don't get too casual, which is why I like the watering can. Big droplets, no volatilization, you're unlikely to inhale any of this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Um, okay, so when we went back a couple slides, remember those um, box shrubs I showed you at the beginning? This is what we found. And this is the color of the healthy bark tissue, it's green. We had started slicing up fairly high on the trunk, and I mean these trees, so when I say high on the trunk, we're talking about boxwood plants that are only this high. So when I say high on the trunk, I'm talking I started at three inches above grade, you know, and worked my way down. And you can see, here's the Phytophthora right through there, and this was Cinnamomai as well. Um, and it just loves fresh plantings in summer, uh, which is why it's really better to do your plantings in the fall. Um, but this, uh, we got reasonable control with Streptomyces lyticus, at least kept it from spreading, because they had a huge number of box plants being put in, and it was probably on the nursery stock, we believe, um, and it stopped spreading as soon as we put that stuff in. We could not save, obviously, these plants. <laughs> they were gone. Yeah. There are plenty of things that, that can, but generally speaking, if I come up with this and I do a fairly thorough, so we were asking about Japanese maple earlier. Our malaria on Japanese maple causes mortality way far in advance of the actual hyphae. It's really surprising. So you can get, you can get sometimes like six inches or a foot of mortality without any hint of um, the, the fungal mycelia coming up through it. And the mycelia is how I feel diagnose our malaria. So I have to be careful with some plants, especially ones I'm not used to working with. And if you're gonna say it's Phytophthora and not our malaria, you should probably go pretty far. I, my suggestion is you go dig into the soil and start digging out the roots and checking those roots as well. Um, then you can, yeah. Um, so, you know, Japanese maple Sausalito. I, I had to take a picture of this because I'd just never seen it this bad before. Um, there is nothing that's gonna bring back a pretty heavily infested plant. None of these therapeutic treatments for Phytophthora include Subdue Max, but the problem with Subdue Max is it's really, it's list, labeled as a fungicide, but it's really a fungistat. It stops things in its tracks where you, when you apply it but it doesn't actually kill the fungus. Or the ph Phytophthoras aren't true fungi, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so that means that if you're not killing it, then it just takes time for it to overcome the subdue. Um, and that's what happens if people, so we got people who are swearing by subdue max. Um, and the problem is if you repeatedly apply this stuff, you will develop a super Phytophthora in short order. So, because it does not kill it, it just stops it. So if you've got valuable landscape plants, it can be a tool, but I don't recommend it as, as um, phosphonate compounds will work better in terms of them st uh, stopping things. But again, they're not very successful therapeutically. They tend to be better for stopping the next Japanese maple down the line from getting it after this one died. Yeah. I'd cut this down, I'd stop watering it immediately and let it sit all summer. I'd dig the roots out, not because I necessarily, um, I just, because Phytophthora won't care. But my concern is you could have our malaria sitting on your soil someplace and if you've got a dying root system, then you could have Phytophthora and our malaria and that would be really bad. So I would dig this root system out as a matter of course, then, I would treat with one of these um, biorational fungicides that we've been talking about. Hopefully I could get it established. Um, and ultimately it's just essentially a prayer. Yeah. Uh, this is a, this is art, not science, but I had a client that applied azomite to a cliff of live oak with uh, phytophthora and I understand, and carved out the infected bark. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, uh, can I, I want to hold that just to make sure I don't um, run out of time here. So, um, so what I would do for Phytophthora is the suppress a my microorganism. So here's Bacillus subtilis, trade names are Rhapsody and Serenade, and Streptomyces laticus, Actinovate, Actina iron. And those are the kinds of things I would be um, considering treating uh, the soils with to minimize risks to future plantings. Other pathogens. So we've covered these. I've, I've left verticillium out. It is technically a soil dwelling pathogen, but it's more of a clogger than a root thing. And often you can find it um, pretty high in the plant. It's, it's a, it's a um, vascular wilt. Uh, the one other thing that I have run across in the North Bay that fits into this group um, of things that you might find is a metaphora. Um, although I've only found it twice in the 12 years I've been here. Um, now this leaves, uh, it causes the same type of symptoms that we've been seeing. It does get into the bark. If you peel the bark away, you'll find this intermingled in the bark, but you'll also find little clumps of it in the soil. It's very pure white. And uh, I've mostly seen it on things in rosaceae. Um, I know it attacks other things. Uh, things. It's often you don't even need to go in. You, it is on the outside of the bark. Um, but there are lots of things that can grow on the outside of bark, so that makes diagnosis of this fairly problematical. But when you go into the bark, you'll find dead sections of bark with white little patches in it, so it starts looking like armillaria. But armillaria is never on the outside in a white, fluffy fungal form. It's either on these rhizomorphs that look like shoestrings, or it's in mushrooms, or those kinds of things. Um, so it's not common, but I thought I'd mention it just because I, it has been found. Um, so back here, what was this? This was a Phytophthora, and it, but it looks like it could have been, you know, if, especially if this was a southwest side and that got a little more sun than this one, it could have been, it could have been sunburn, it could have been all kinds of different things. This, anybody want to, we, this is just chronic drought. Well, how do we know that? Well, there were a few clues when we started looking at it. It's an eichler. How many places get built with, when did they build Eichlers? Anybody know? 50s and 60s, exactly. That tree was planted in the 50s and early 60s in a lawn. And this was planted in Marin when they didn't have water restrictions because everybody had, there were only a few thousand people in Marin anyway, right? So people watered the snot out of these things. And this fruitless mulberry has been living on its reserves and eking by for 50 years. Um, but look at the landscaping now. Is that lawn? How much water is this poor thing getting? I got called out by this whole HOA area because they thought they had a disease, and the disease is called high water prices. Um, these trees were healthy-ish, I mean, but they just are not getting the water that they've needed for decades. And then this is root weevils. Finally, this was none of the above. We can talk about doing a, a solid root crown inspection and all this other stuff. And I did root crowns inspections on these and the root crowns looked pretty bad. It was just not clear. And in this case, it looks like a root crown problem because the distributions are fairly uniform in that they are attacking mostly the young new leaves and the things. This poor soul had an ex-boyfriend that knew she loved to garden. And he came in with a sublethal uh, dose of Roundup and hit her entire garden. And I kept doing root crown inspection after root crown inspection, trying to figure out what the heck was going on here. And that one took me a long time to figure out. So there is a company that you can send your samples to um, in Woodland that will run uh, glyphosate you know, for, for poisoning symptoms. I'm sorry? Yeah, the ex-boyfriend test, yeah. And, um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's very informative. So when you really get stuck and it looks like it could potentially be herbicide, you can always send it off to, um, to them and, and go. So root crown inspections, here's, here's a case. So you can see I did my cut in here and it was dead there. Um, but in other cuts, it had been this green color. And 
This is exactly how you get it done to figure out. Now, all that said, you start, you work down, you, you keep going down several inches below grade because you want to make sure that it is actually something that's killing the roots and assess conditions of the roots, assess the conditions of the soil. It's all part of pick, figuring out a bigger picture. This one, I got wrong. I mean, you, that's the end result, but the way, I'll go back to that in a second. The way this ended up showing up was, somebody brought me a Japanese maple. And we all know that Japanese maples get verticillium at the drop of a hat. And they tend to get verticillium in these drought and drench irrigation cycles. So I took this Japanese maple and I cut into it and I got the classic vascular streaking that you get on bigger branches when you just slice down and you say, oh look, black streaking, Japanese maple, no problem, verticillium, done. And so I started telling them, here's what you need to do. You need to make sure they get more consistent moisture, yada, yada, yada. And they kept looking at me like I was on glue. You know, and um, I'm like, what? And they're like, no, we wash our car next to that thing all the time. You know, we're, th that Japanese maple is staying moist a lot. In fact, if anything, it's getting overwatered. And that's what made me stop with this whole thing. Because yes, it had verticillium, but it also had Phytophthora. Um, and I had to go, that's when I started doing the root crown inspection and, and going down and figuring out what the real problem was. Because I diagnosed it and it didn't fit. You know, your client's your best tool uh, if they tell the truth, which they don't always. So water management, all of this comes down essentially to water management. I mean, root crown root inspection. So, Assess the water status, typically 12 inches below grade. So what we're looking at here, you know, we've got a landscape. The top three inches have maybe even four inches are moist. And below that, it's just bone dry. This is really common in California soils. And it's what we're trying to get, what everybody's been talking about here, doing deeper irrigations. And that works great because it allows your plants to go longer between waterings and it allows this top area to dry out. And that's where the pathogens tend to be is in those top six inches of soil because that's where the air is. Um, so we want that top, it, we want this to be flipped ideally when we do this. We want to be able to probe down a foot into the soil and have a little bit of moisture down eight to 10 inches and we want the top to be dry in a perfect world. Now, you know, so, this was telling us something. This is one of the reasons I like soil probes. Instead of just like some little meter you stick into the soil, you know, because you actually get to see the texture, the organic matter content, all that other stuff. So let the plant tell you how it's doing. Check the whole soil out. And remember that the effects occur over years, so your site history is going to be important. Um, and remember to be humble, because <laughs> otherwise you're going to screw it up. And that's it. Um, Thanks. Okay, so we had at least one question on azomite and, and treatment of sudden oak death infected oaks and how much azomite can play into it. So I'm going to just talk, um, some of the research on this is my research that I did with Mateo, some of it's just Mateo's research that I'm going to be talking about. So azomite, as a product, was not necessarily tested. What was tested was um, calcium additions in the form of gypsum and with and without agrifos. So agrifos, in the f if you add gypsum and you a apply agrifos, Gypsum seems to have some kind of synergy that is not understood what's happening, but you can measure, uh, according to Mateo's research, improved resistance with the addition of calcium, whether it's in gypsum or oyster shell or azomite. Um, there are a number of different forms of it, but if you can get calcium into these trees with agrifos, it seems to help. Whether these, the calcium helps Without agrifos, I don't know. Um, my suspicion is that it doesn't necessarily help because, for a number of reasons. The bark scribing thing is a whole different story, and this is a story about why science matters. And it's a little bit about folks doing single-off experiments and then 
coming to conclusions, or even low replication number of experiments. And this is a whole other talk I have, and I'm going to condense it into three minutes. So if we, I miss some details, um, forgive me. But essentially, oaks as a general population have this huge range of genetic diversity. And a lot of the oaks out there are quite resistant to sudden oak death. We don't think of it that way because those, oh, we see a lot of trees dying. And when you see half of a forest dying, it's kind of alarming. Um, on the other hand, the guy who had my job before me tried bark scribing. He had a whole bunch of different, and, and there's good reason for it. So even I saw it. When I was doing sudden oak death work, you know, almost 20 years ago now, um, and I would go in and I would scribe, we'd have these bleeding spots, and people would say, is my oak infected? At the time, we didn't even know bay laurel was the infective agent. So we would just go sample the oaks directly. So I'd cut in, and I'd find the edge of the canker, and I'd, I'd sample from the edge of the canker, and I'd plate it out, and it would grow out or not, you know, that sort of thing. And then I'd follow up a year later to see how that tree was doing. And half the time, I would see that the tree had produced nice callus tissue around the infection, and the infection had cracked and shrunk and dried out, because Phytophthora likes things cool, dark and moist. And I had just made it warm, dry, and light, right? So it made sense. When I looked at it, I was like, wow, this bark, you know, ha treatment, who needs, I'm treating them just by, by sampling for them, because I can see the Phytophthora infections shrinking and drying. I wasn't alone. I mean, I mean, I was doing this work, but so was Ted Swicky and a bunch of other people, and they saw the same thing. And so was this, my predecessor, the guy who came before me. So this hypothesis was, what if we just slice into the trees and we let the, um, and we use that as a, uh, a treatment? And there's reason to think it worked. Because if you look in UCIPM and you look on the citrus sites, and even today there is at least one site that still has not been updated, they say bark scribing is an acceptable treatment for infected citrus trees. You just cut the bark, you don't go all the way to the wood, you just go cut the bark down to about halfway through and you will cure the infection. So it was in the literature on citrus for Phytophthora, and so it made sense. So my predecessor went through and did about 200 trees in an uncontrolled study. The problem is it's an uncontrolled study. And why, does control, why do controls matter? Well, it's, it's simply this. The, um, how, do you, how do you know that you're actually being eff effective? In other words, how do I know that, say, if I have a canker that's this big, how do I know it's that same size canker I'm comparing to this canker? How do I have something to compare my treatments to that isn't shaved, right? I'm shaving one tree, so I'm treating it. How do I have another comparable treatment that I, I leave alone and watch that canker grow, right? I need to have a control. That's a scientific control. If I cut into it, I'm treating it, so I can't. So we tried to find non-invasive ways to detect cankers and things like that. Unable to do it, long story short. Doesn't work. So the only way to do this, and this is why my predecessor never controlled any of his experiments, because you can't cut into it. As soon as you cut into it to figure out what size the canker is, at time zero, you've just treated it. OK. He went out and did about 200 trees, and his philosophy was, I'm just going to do about 200 trees, and if it really works, we'll see it over time. And he came to the conclusion that this probably works. And other people heard about the research and started treating with bark, scri bark scribing. The, I, I had to do things a different way. I got asked to clean, clean this mess up. So I went out and I infected trees and with a known size of Phytophthora at time zero, plugged it into a whole bunch of trees. This took a long time to put together because when you ask people, hey, can I, I want to take, I need to, small trees are all fairly resistant to Phytophthora. The big trees are the ones that are not. So I need to take a bunch of your big, mature, gorgeous live oaks. Can I infect them with a deadly pathogen and then measure the effect on your trees? And I need to do it not just once. I need to do it like 30 times. So I can, so anybody willing to donate 30 heritage oaks to me? The answer is no. People value those trees. So it took me three years to find sites on state park land and other places like that where people would let me infect trees that were of a certain size and risk killing them. Um, 
And what we found out at the end of all of this is that the trees killed the Phytophthora a huge percentage of the time, probably 50% or more. So that means that when people are running these things and they're saying, I had an infected tree and I did X, Y, and Z to them, and, and you can't figure that out if you don't control, right? But they, if they say, I did X, Y, and Z to them, if you don't know what the background kill rate is, you have no idea how effective your treatments are. So I had people coming and telling me that wind chimes worked for curing Phytophthora romorum. I had people coming and telling me bark scribing worked. I had people telling me that every concoction under the sun you could spray on trees was, was effective. And the truth is, most of them were not. Most of them were simply people taking their treatments and giving credit to themselves for being a genius and figuring this stuff out when the tree was doing all the work. The tree was killing the Phytophthora when it got to this size, and then they were cutting into it and saying, oh, we caught it in time, it's small, you know? And then they cut into another tree and it's like, oh, it's way too big, it's way too late. That tree, the big tree, could not stop the disease, and so nothing you were gonna do was ever gonna solve it. The other tree with the small canker already stopped the disease. It did not matter what you put on it. So bark scribing is a treatment really Although it looks very, I was very convinced when I started this, it was like a no-brainer, I should be able to get this slam dunk, and it turns out we were wrong. And that's why science matters, and that's why it's replicated, and that's why you have to have controls. Because otherwise, you're just, you're gonna get fooled by your own ideas, because everybody loves their own ideas. They're your children, you know? I mean, so the, the moral of the story is don't believe everything you think, and there are a lot of people who do. And I'm um, so, and, uh, uh, yeah, question. Um, was, was it some uh, video and fiction of the data? But, um, I'm, I'm just talking to you. My question is like, uh, do you have any like, uh, affected trees? Uh, do you have any data of, you know, the nose canker, for example? Um, you know, if there's a canker, maybe there's video attractions on um, some of those affected trees. So we're talking about my bark scribing study? Yeah. We, <laughs> I, I kept it, it, it's a great question, and that's actually in that talk, you know, I just tried to abbreviate it. Yeah, one of the problems with our study was we, the trees killed the pathogen about half the time, and I was trying to see efficacy of bark scribing, so that meant I went in with 60 trees, I got 20 at three different sites, right, and that was a lot of work just getting those 60 trees, let me tell you, right. And in most of the sites, half my samples dropped out. And then on another chunk of the things, I lost quite a few trees to beetles coming in and saying, oh, look, it's in a Phytophthora infection. And they nailed that thing, and it was gone. When I ended up, I ended up with a very small number of trees that I had to try and use, somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 trees left out of 60. Um, that I had to sit down and try and run my statistics on. And it's not a really great sample size for running statistics, so my error bars are huge. So, but I can, so th that is my disclaimer. When I say it doesn't work, there are some differences, but they're not statistically significant because if, in order to get st statistic significance, I would have to have a much larger sample size. But there's a lesson in that too, which is any treatment that has a small enough effect that you need a huge sample size to find it, isn't going to be significant on a landscape scale. Because what you're trying to, because now what it's telling you is your efficacy is somewhere around five to 10%. So bark scribing might be worthwhile, but it, it might actually be effective. Is it cost effective? I don't know. We would need, I can pretty much tell you if it's effective, it is only effective at a fairly, it, it is, I'm just not spitting the words out as well as I would like today. They talk about statistic significance and landscape significance are two different things. To sell people a treatment on bark scribing for X number of hundreds of dollars when it has a chance to make a 5% difference on the survival of your tree may not really be worth it. You know what I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to say. Sure. How much bark is taken off when you do the scribe? That depends on the size of the canker. Remember that walnut tree? So it's just the canker. Is there, is yeah, there otherwise there? it's sort of like, yeah, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. Yeah. You're right. Um, if you strip all the bark off of a tree, you're probably creating more problems for it than you're solving. We've done it with grapevines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. OK, well, um, no more questions? Ah, good. Thank you very much.